<coughs> How's it going, folks? Currently, we're now live. I haven't plugged in the microphone, Bianca. We'll wait and see um, what we get from other people, uh, whether they can hear us or not. Bianca, we try to um, do a joint mic. Uh, between the pair of us, but it's just not working out too well. We've got to practice a bit more. We tried to um, do a joint mic uh, between the pair. And just had to mute Bianca's computer. Sorry. So let us know if you can see us in the chat there. Hello, Mr. Michael. I know who you are now. Richard, Joachim, Matt, and Down Under Fella. So... Just excuse me while I take a while to get started because I want to have a bit of a gander at a few things on how this works because I'm using StreamYard, as you can probably see, and Bianca's just going to be following along on YouTube, and there is a delay on all of this. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm not going to press that or we'll end up in some sort of weird feedback loop. So there we go. Now I'm starting to see some comments. Just finished the chop and flip with a few ornamentals nice one mate g'day to arizona hello tennessee and cheers mate not quite uh midday yet so yeah on the coffee still and i will be until dinner time anyway so there we go uh i just started growing my beard out only about two months in <laughs> hoping to get a nice one as yours cheers mate um g'day jennifer nice to say g'day to you in person ish for a change Pratty, g'day. John, how's it going, mate? So, yeah, I'm just going to wait a little while. I'll uh, just do a little bit of rambling if you guys um, want to put any comments up in the comment section and just uh, wait and see if we get about 35 people in before I start uh, so no one can complain that I started too soon. G'day, Florida. Uh, I think I already said that. Maybe not. Melbourne. New Caledonia, Arizona. Thanks, Peyton. Um, Bianca, would you like to say a few things? And if you can let us know in the chat if you can hear Bianca, that would be fantastic. Hello, everyone. G'day, Cleveland. Can you let us know if you heard Bianca, please? We'll just wait for the G'day, delay. Virginia. And yeah, we'll just wait for the delay. So, anyway, don't forget, yes, please hit the thumbs up and share if you feel like it. Don't want to force anyone to do anything they don't want to do. Jennifer said loud and clear. Loud and clear. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, talking to another live streamer about using worms and aquaponics mini beds. Uh, Bianca, do you want to take some notes down? Because we'll come back to the questions. There we go. We'll get a book. And a pen. And a pen. <clears throat> you should be able to scroll back up as well. Yeah. So we're all, we're all newbies, folks. Thank you, Taurus. Thank you, Down Under Fella. Thank you, Tad and Antonio. So today's um, Hangout is going to be answering some questions that I've taken off of uh, recent comments on videos on today, Washington, Vancouver. Um, yes, um, I'm taking a couple of questions off of comment sections on videos recently. I'm trying to stay up to date with all the new comments that are there. Uh, being placed on the videos, older ones and newer ones, uh, just to help folks out. So um, there's a few that I thought I'd just answer in person because I think they'd help other people out as well. I just got to do the eyebrows, excuse me. Um, so yeah, well, I thought we'd have a crack at that first. West Virginia, how's it going, Steve? Not a problem. I think we'll uh, get cracking and start off. I was hoping to be really professional, have um, slides I could share and all that sort of thing, but just got a, a little bit uh, ahead of myself with the artwork, doing a few other things at the moment. So uh, anyway, um, Golden Queen has asked, hi, can you put different species of fish in the same tank? I live in the States and wanted to use channel catfish, uh, bluegill, carpi, and maybe striped bass, and um, if I can, walleye. Uh, well, unfortunately, I don't know most of those species whatsoever, other than seeing that other people have used them in their systems. I do know people have put bluegill and channel catfish in together. Um, cra uh, crappy, crappy, uh, I'm not too sure. I am very sorry. Uh, but what would be great um, is if you folks out there could leave a comment in the chat here 
And what I'll be doing is um, leaving a link, uh, sorry, a, yeah, a link under um, Golden Queen's comment on the video where they've made it and they can come back here and have a look in the live feed and I'll copy and paste any responses that you folks good. Um, it'd be great if we could uh, have a little bit of a help around the community itself. Uh, you guys did a fan just, uh, fantastic job on a recent live stream. So it'd be good to see um, yeah, that continue. And the chat is really slow here, so I think I'm on a really slow lag. Um, so, yeah, that's one from Golden Cream. Um, Gustavo has asked a uh, rather long one. Um, Hi, Rob. Uh, you told about the worry of snakes around the system. I think that was a recent one with the sweet potato. Uh, by the way, there's a sweet potato um, pruning video that will be coming later on tonight, Aussie time, at the normal 6.30 p.m. slot of standard time. I think that's 7.30 for you folks down south. Um, so, yeah, worried about snakes around the system. Um, yeah, if I can't see where I'm walking in the backyard, I get a little bit concerned, especially through summer, because we do get eastern browns through the yard here all the time. And if you look them up on the world's most venomous, venomous state, snake list, you'll understand why. Um, he has an outdoor system with a similar problem. Um, I was thinking about other animals' waste, like birds, bats, roaches, rodents leaving residue. It's a nice way to frame it. Um, and how it would reach the system water. Should we worry about this? Can they carry any diseases in, um, into the food or the fish? Um, feel about making a video on the issue? Is there a lab test we can take? Uh, bacteria, viruses, water safety, and such, and have a good day. Have a good one yourself, mate. Um, my, I won't be doing a video on this, mainly because it, I'm, I'm not a uh, PhD doctor, and I don't have the um, all the evidence at hand to um, put out there um, without getting sued. But what I will tell you is we've had rats in our soil gardens. We have bats, uh, the fruit bats in particular, flying foxes, um, awesome. deposit possums, um, rats, snails even can be bad because they eat um, rodent uh, feces and then transmit the um, diseases through that. And I know in Sydney there was a couple of cases of a bad disease outbreak a few years ago because of um snails um basically it's going to happen in soil it's going to happen in um, aquaponics hydroponics anywhere where nature has access to your food um the the ins and outs of it is, is basically just good hygiene wash any food that you get coming into the um the house give it a good wash a good clean i know some people swear by using bicarb i've heard used pe people talk about using vinegar and even um peroxide uh, to uh, wash their veggies and leafy greens and whatnot when they come into the house um, just to make sure that they're, they're, they're safe. Uh, it's just one of those things. Um, we're a part of nature, even though we live in houses and uh, disassociated from nature. These things are on the food that you're buying in the supermarkets anyway. Uh, hopefully they've just um, cleaned it before uh, it gets to the shelf and you purchase it. Uh, same thing goes for um, yeah down the back there in the, the veggie patch. So it's something you've got to be conscious of. Just yeah, good food hygiene. Wash the wash the produce as it comes into the house, and you should be good to go. Bianca's got her hands up. Going back to Golden Queen's comments. Golden Queen's uh, question that you were talking about. Steve says catfish and bluegill will work together as well as bass and bluegill. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate that, mate. Um, so yeah, I'll copy and paste that over as well. And um, yeah, so we can let them know under that video as well. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, helps you, Gustavo, and anyone else who was curious about that. Uh, Lynn Hool has asked or said, oh, actually, this is from a wicking bed video. So yeah, it doesn't have to be aquaponics. It can be um, wicking beds or any anything that you're interested about gardening. And um, yeah, I'll hope to help you out where I can. Uh, Lynn Hool has asked, I love watching your YouTube videos. Thanks, hope they've helped. Um, I can get IBC totes for $50 each, but they've had um, stored chlorine in them. Are they safe to use in your wicking beds? Um, same thing would go for um, hydroponics and, uh, and yeah, hydroponics and aquaponics as well. Um, yeah, the chlorine is fine to use. It is what they pretty much will use to sanitize the water before from a, the treatment plants uh, until it gets to your house. Uh, just make sure it's pure chlorine and not some sort of chlorine uh, derivative or um, compound. Um, the reason I've included this is not so much just for the chlorine. Um, it's for any any IBCs or drums or anything you buy secondhand. Um, a little bird who works for the government has told me that um, technically, if you're buying from a distributor here in Australia who handles 
um, drum muster um, recycles it and sells it to the public. It technically should be clean and it should be right to go. I don't trust any of them. Um, so I've got some from distribution centers before that had aloe vera juice and Coca-Cola um, syrup. Oh, mentioned a brand name, sorry, folks. But it had a dark poison um, syrup flavoring in it. And they both had residues in the bottom of them. Um, so, yeah, wash anything and everything out. Uh, make sure it's good and clean. Uh, the good tanks to use, if you can find them at the moment, I know there's a little bit of a world shortage going on, um, is AdBlue, uh, which is a diesel additive that's used a lot here in Australia and I think pretty much all in most um, developed countries around the world that cuts down on the emissions from a diesel engine. It is basically ammonia and demineralized water mixed together. And what do we want for our aquaponic systems when we're cycling them? We want a little bit of ammonia. So the AdBlue tanks, um, yeah, fine to use. I would still give them a hose out. I wouldn't just, you know, any residue left in there, I wouldn't leave that in there when you're building your system. I'd definitely wash them out. Um, give them a good clean and otherwise you're going to end up with massive ammonia levels. But things like that are fine. Uh, other things I like to use are vinegar. Um, vinegar drums, we've used aloe vera juice and soft drink or soda drink um, syrups, as I've mentioned before. I've also used a high concentrate ammonia additive for chicken feed. Uh, came from a chicken farm and they used to buy it in and mix up their own chicken feed. Um, so I used some of that. Strangely enough, when I washed that out, um, only had the slightest amount of residue in the base. And even though it is ammonia, um, which plants will take up and transfers all the way through to the different forms of nitrogen that plants will use, um, it actually killed a strip of lawn in our backyard for probably about four or five months. Yeah. yeah a little brown strip so do be careful when you um hose these things out that you don't yeah kill off your um lawn or whatever john's just also asked about the ad blue could you cycle a system with it the ad blue yep yeah. um yeah you can but the problem is it would be in fairly high concentration i mean I suppose you could just give it a quick hose out and then um, put a little bit of water in and then do a test and see what sort of an ammonia concentration you're going to end up with it uh in there but um yeah it's um might be, might be a bit strong if you if you leave a little bit too much on there and uh, also to the nooks and crannies around the, the the valve even if it looks clean and dried there will be some residue around the valve down the bottom and around the lid around the top so yeah it may be too much it may not but just do that test and you should be right to go um so yeah i hope that answers your question lynn and anyone else oh um just quickly Things that I would avoid, I know people have used them though, uh, things like glyphosate drums, um, uh, probably oils like uh, um, fuel oils and things like that might be a little bit hard to clean out. Um, along with glyphosate, any herbicide or anything like that. Uh, and as a little bit of a, um, a heads up, most of these IBCs should come with the label on the side uh, that has what was in them previously. And then you can just look up there, what's it called, MS... Uh, the medical data sheet, M MDS, or there's a, you can medical actually, safety sheet. medical, thank you, Bianca, medical safety sheet, look up the medical safety sheet, sheet link, and they generally have clean up options for um, if there's a spill of that chemical, and that'll give you a few ideas. Um, I just ran companies I've, uh, for styrofoam when I was contemplating using um, raft beds in a system a while back, um, and any chemical drum that I don't know exactly what the chemical is after a good search online, I, I just ring up the company and ask them. I've never been refused. Everyone's always been good natured and also um, done a little bit of um, evangelical work, evangelical work for the aquaponics um, community at the same time. So yeah, um, just something to keep in mind. Um, always go to the source. So yeah, hope that helps. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. We might just leave them there for now. And are there any questions, Bianca? Yes. There are questions. Um, Antonio asked what type of worm is best to use in aquaponics? Yep. Um, compost worms are the best ones. I have seen people dig out garden worms, earthworms, and try and add them in the system, and you pretty much all don't see them again. Um, compost worms are the best way to go. Um, they'll survive the wet environment and they will thrive a lot better than earthworms. Their diets are slightly different as well. So compost worms are the way to go. Don't necessarily go out and buy 500 and throw them in a brand new system though. There won't be enough for them to feed on. Uh, maybe um, dig around your compost pile, um, pull out a couple from the compost pile and toss them in there, even if it's only four or five in a brand new system. And after a while, you'll find that the, the numbers just explode. Um, 
I just threw some in for a laugh in the very first system uh, from our worm farm, literally a handful, probably 50 to 100, and we ended up with them all through the beds, even the beds I didn't put them in. So, yeah, um, definitely the compost worms, probably not a good idea to put in the um, earthworms, though. So, hope that helps. Um, hang on. Uh, Matt Talks Beer said, uh, what type of system would you recommend for beginners to to, for their first for your first system um well if you're going for table fish i wouldn't start with anything less than a um 500 or a 500 liter 130 um gallon fish tank and it start with probably you know 10 to 12 fish basic chop and flip system is ideal for that with an ibc or you can get a 500 liter or 130 gallon um, tote and then get a, a smaller grow bed probably around about 300 liter ish um, you can get um, similar feed troughs from wherever you buy your um, stock tank and yeah just start with that uh, if you're not sure if aquaponics is right for you um, if you're fa fairly confident that you really want to get into it and grow a decent amount of table fish I would definitely look at starting out with a 1,000 litre fish tank, uh, 260 ish. I'm just going to talk litres, sorry, folks. Uh, 1,000 litre um, IBC or fish tank, just to give you a visual, and then set up a system. Uh, my, I'd, my prefer would be a, um, uh, a, a single loop system if you're just getting out, uh, starting out, and want to keep things fairly simple. That's basically a sump tank underneath a grow bed or wherever you want to locate it really and probably around about 600 litres of biofiltration minimum i'll uh, probably better off to go with around about 750 ish which is just the ibc's um, cut around about a foot or 300 mil and um, that should give you enough biofiltration um, just to process the waste from about 10 to 12 fish per grow bed so you can have anywhere up to around about 36 fish in the original uh, fish tank thousand litre um, start off with something like that the beauty of the single loop is you've got one pump feed straight into the fish tank then you can either run that water out straight to the grow beds let them act as both solids and biological filtration which i don't recommend or run them through a solid separator like a radial flow settler and then have the outlet from that then go into the beds uh, the main reason i say um, it's not a good idea to um, pump your solids straight into the grow beds is um, they really do need to be cleaned out every so often uh, which and that has a few caveats like stocking rates of fish how much food is going in and therefore how much solid waste is being generated and passed on to the grow beds um, a few caveats in there, but basically there will come a time where you have to clean out the beds. And if you have that solids filtration in there, it just means it, it just captures so many of those um, larger solids, gets them out of the system. So you're only going to have the smaller solids in there. And don't worry about nutrients not being in the system. Um, there's so many just floating around the water, either dissolved or in the smaller particles that the plants will get nutrients. And um, it's nothing to grab another drum, um, pop all the solids waste you get from your radial flow settler into it, um, just put an air bubbler in it, aerobically digest that, and then add that nutrient-rich water after a period of time back into the grow beds after you let the solids settle out a bit, and those nutrients will, will remain in the system. Um, it's just that they're being taken out, um, processed, um, the nutrients are added in or suspended in the water and added back in. So uh, a basic little... Um, system like that is the way to go i think and i just saw larry pop up g'day larry how's it going mate we need to have another hangout ourselves um when it's time that i can crack a beer as well and join you um so yeah i, I hope that helps you mate um that was matt talks, beer. matt talks beer hope that helps you matt um but yeah a basic little system like that i reckon is a great way to cut your teeth and then if it's a single loop i mean it's only one step further if you want to get really involved and make it a split flow and add some more biological filtration maybe some fine solids maybe an integrated mineralization system uh, like rob over at uh, bigelow brook farm has in his system do check out his channel by the way um so yeah it it can get more complex or you could just keep it like a basic single loop like that if all you're interested in doing is growing a couple of herbs a few salad plants and um harvesting fish for the table so there we go uh, there you go to my mobile yeah um I, I was counting. There is an eight-second lag. There's an eight-second lag, so there yeah, we go, folks. So. Oh, there's a Mr. Mac. Hello, Mr. Mac. 
Um, and a smoke screen TV. G'day. Oh, hello. <laughs> Couple of people we know. Um, Cryptic82 said he had, or he, she, sorry, um, has just started a small new system. Mm -hmm. There's no plants or fish in them yet. What should they add to the system before adding the plants and fish? Rightio. Um, if you're going to cycle your system, my go-to is pretty much, well, um, a fish emulsion. Uh, I know some people will add straight uh, ammonia into the system. That's basically, again, it's setting up that a whole um, nutrient train chain from the fish waste, which is ammonia and ammonium, ammonium mainly, all the way through to plant available nitrate. Um, by the way, plants will take up ammonia in the other ones, but it's just the nitrate that is friendly for the fish. Um, I, I like the fish emulsion mainly because the fish emulsion will um, give other nutrients as well. You're not just going to get the straight ammonia. Um, you're going to get uh, potassium, um, uh, calcium, um, which are big ones, iron, phosphates, um, then your magnesium, all the other elements as well. So your plants will thrive at the same time as you're cycling the system. Uh, now, there's a little bit of confusion and a word of warning about using the fish emulsion. I've had a different experiences using the same product. Some of it was very old and had it for a number of years. And when I added it, I got ammonia straight away um, in my little test readings. When I tested other stuff that was new, I got no ammonia for a couple of days. And um, what I'm hypothesizing, but could be incorrect, is a lot like urine. Um, urine is urea. Um, it, which then breaks down into ammonia if you're cycling with um, urine or urea, the same thing. Um, there is a period, there's a lag between adding the urea and then for it to turn to ammonia before it then breaks down or transfers, oxidizes into nitrates. So I have had that same experience with fish emulsion. Um, had someone contact me saying they followed my video, they added it in and they had nothing for two days. So they kept adding more. And then all of a sudden um, they had a massive green result, a darkest green they've seen on the test. And that is a clear indication of just the, the steps it takes from um, urea all the way through until it finally be old to ammonia and then finally ultimately nitrate. So um, my, my vote would be to go with the fish emulsion if you can get it. Um, uh, here in Australia, um, that's easy. Charlie Carp is my go-to. There's a few other brands as well. Um, and uh, I think in America, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I know there's a power feed here, but maybe a power feed in America, but there's or Miracle Grow maybe. Oh, actually, I don't know. I shouldn't say brand names. Uh, but if someone could put that in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Um, American and even European, English. Um, versions of fish emulsion, that'd be great. Uh, urine um, is another one you can add. It will have more than just the um, urea, which changes into um, ammonia and then through. Um, and by the way, there's millions of people around the world that farm with urine. They save it. They're in um, areas where uh, fertilizer aren't, isn't available. You just let it age, break down, pathogens die, and it is a safe fertilizer. It needs to be watered down. Um, one caveat is if you're on any harsh um, toxic pharmaceuticals. Um, there's mild pharmaceuticals I wouldn't worry about, like paracetamol and things like that. But if any of the full-on ones like chemotherapy, definitely don't use that. Um, but yeah, um, if your urine's fairly clean, your diet's fairly good, uh, let that break down um, over a course of probably around about, I let ours break down for, well, well mine, they wouldn't play with me. Uh, <laughs> I let mine break down for three months before I started using it. it. Yeah, so um, I let mine break down for three months and then used that. And I only used a small amount. I think I used 50 mils in 10 litres of water as a um, heavy brassica feed, drench on the soil. Um, for aquaponics, probably use a little bit less. Well, actually, no, you could probably use, um, yeah, probably 50 to 100 mils in a 1,000 litre system and just um, test after a while and see how you go. Howdy again, Larry. Um, so we're going to create a loop here. Um, I said we are part of the nutrient cycle. We are part of the nutrient cycle, exactly. Eventually, whether we like it or not, when we die, whether we're burnt, buried, whatever, lost at sea, our nu nutrients will go back into the um, the cycle. So I won't get too philosophical, though. Um, G'day, uh, Smashley. Um, so, yeah, urea is fine to add as well, and I know I've um, gone off on a bit of a tangent, but, yeah, um, it's something that you can also add. Um, you can get it in a straight fertilizer form, but again, all you're doing is adding the ammonia, which will eventually oxidize into nitrate. And yeah, that's that's not adding any other um, elements in there. So hope that helps. Howdy, Owen. It was great to meet you in person yesterday. 
And I hope you've already got that bed set up, mate. Um, <laughs> yeah, Owen um, came out and picked up a tray for his new system. If you are on Facebook and you're in aquaponics and in Australia, um, check out the Brisbane Aquaponics um, page on Facebook. Owen has been documenting his adventures in aquaponics there for years. And he is one of my favorite uh, blokes to follow and see what he's come up with. Growing some great bananas or bananas in the aquaponics system and other bits and pieces. And hopefully I'll be able to um, go up there and check out his system very soon. And just a quick shout out also too, if you're here in the uh, chat, is Mr. Bruce, uh, the Jade Perchman, aka Perchman now, um, from Aussie Fish up at Isis or Childers um, in the Gympie region. Actually, no, sorry, it's not Gympie region. No, it's not. It's Bundy. Bundy region. Um, he's got Aussie Fish Fish Farm. It's so. Bundaberg. For non oh yeah Bundaberg for non-Australians um yeah he's up in that area there and he said he was going to join in the chat he may not have made it but hopefully uh fingers crossed I'm going to um go up to the Aussie fish hatchery I haven't spoken to him in detail about it and we'll do one of these live streams from there so I get some aquaculture people on as well and um yeah I have a bit of an all-around chat so um Seymour says have you ever found shrimp have I really want I'm 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 not a big fish eater. Many people know this already. Um, crayfish, I don't mind. Shellfish, I don't mind. Would love to grow um, shrimp or prawns. Um, but, yeah, I, there are a couple of native species that apparently you can grow in an aquarium culture, so I can't see why you can't grow them in aquaponics as well. There is a stocking difference, though. I'm not too sure about if it's like crayfish or the red claw, the Aussie um, crayfish from up north here in Queensland. They tend to have a lower stocking density than fish. So that's why you can use them in a the system technically, but they don't produce the amount of waste that most people want if they want also the byproduct, which is the veggies growing off the um, the animal's waste. So I do know people use um, uh, cherry shrimp and in their um, brush filters and different biofilters bio and even under their grow beds. Um, that's the freshwater with the long nippers. That yeah, that's what. That's an English one, isn't it? No, the Aussie one. From up north, oh, okay. I forget the name. It's something gigantic or something like that from memory. Starts with an N. Um, but yeah, they they have them under their raft beds just to clean up any solids waste that comes through. Um, so you can grow them. Um, just haven't seen anyone who's managed to do a decent harvest of the large ones. I've been doing this for over ten years now, and I've seen loads of people say they're going to do it on forums and groups. And <laughs> I've never yet to see someone say this is the, the the prawns that I harvested from the system or shrimp. I've harvested from the shrimp and chucked on the barbie. Um, so, yeah. Hey, Cameron. Um, so, yeah, not something I've seen with a table-sized shrimp at this point in time. Okay, Rosemary. Um, and Tania. Yep. She has... Oh, this... I'm interested to know who this was. Seen someone incorporate a composting bin into an aquaponic system. Have you ever heard of this before? I'm just thinking bin juice. Bin juice. Ooh. Bin juice is all elements. Bianca works in waste and is one of her favourite smells is bin juice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen people do that. Um, oh, it was an Aussie. Yeah, it was an Aussie person. His name started with J from memory. And he had a little compost, one of those little itty-bitty bin style or like countertop compost bins in his aquaponic system and there he was throwing in in particular um, bananas for potassium and other bits and pieces and the idea is basically the um, compost worms come in um, they have a bit of a munch and then go out through the bed and deposit their waste and oh pardon me coffee burps um the um the compost worms will break some of that waste down into plant available elements that the plants can then take up then Pardon me. The other biota, um, bacteria, fungi, uh, uh, other little critters um, in the grow beds themselves will then break down the, um, the worm waste further and also the um, waste in the compost bin directly and turn that into plant available nutrients. Uh, basically, they've got to break the organics down into um, elemental form for the plants. So, um, yeah, I have seen it done. Um, I wouldn't be... Um, yeah, I'm... It's not something I've looked into. I do know some people will set up, like particularly in floating raft systems and um, NFT systems, nutrient film technique, where they want a solids filtration before the the actual uh, deep water section. They will flow their water through basically into a media bed that is jam-packed, filled with um, compost worms and other additives. Um, people will do up cultures and pop them in there, bacterial and whatnot, um, natural farming style. 
and let the fish waste decompose in there. And I have seen some of those guys add in other bits and pieces as well. Um, not something I've looked into greatly. Um, Steve Dredd, um, he might have some information on that. Also too, Matthias Olsson. I haven't seen either of them here in the chat, uh, but there, um, Steve Dredd is potent ponics and um, Matthias has got a lot of information he shared and we've chatted about. And there are some other people um, just from the Facebook groups. Um, oh, I forget his name. He does a regenerative aquaponics. Um, I think he's done some stuff on that sort of natural um, dosing with um, probiotics and lactose and something like that as well. So um, get more more bacteria and stuff in there to break down that organic matter that goes in. Um, but, yeah, it would be something interesting to do. I mean, I've got so many plans that I want, so many things I want to try. I think I'd need half a dozen to a dozen systems because I'd want to do them individually in, in a system I know that works, um, sand filters, um, that basic media bed um, composting system, uh, system just with a compost bucket in it as well. Um, there's loads of different things I'd like to try, um, but it's just space-wise. So, unfortunately, you're going to have to search around and uh, get definites on those ones. Um, just Larry, I've got this one here. In my experience, low pH kills shellfish. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, I found with our first, yeah, that's what happened with our crayfish. Um, it was fine and dandy when we put the red claw in the sump to begin with. Sorry, we're just skipping back one here. Uh, fine and dandy when we put the um, crayfish in the sump to begin with. They were molting fine. Uh, we lost one or two here and there, um, which we pretty much all put down to crayfish like to play Highlander. There can be only one, so they like to predate on their um, tank mates. Um, and, yeah, as the pH in the system fell, um, basically that happens as a course of the nitrification process, if you're not aware. Uh, I think it just made their malts... Um, very thin and basically it also inhibits their ability to molt from memory as well so yeah not too good on the crayfish and um, yeah brutal on each other when they molt yeah they yeah we've seen um we we um had a few in a tank in the house here and we had anywhere from about oh, four inches um with 100 mil all the way down to the smallest one was uh probably around about 40 mil inch and a half and um out of all of them it was the runt that won because every time a large one molted, he was straight in there for a feast. And I don't know if it was the molt cycle was off or whatever, but he ended up being the winner. Um, so, yeah, we ended up with one in the end. And they were the little blue um, destructor, I think they're called, Terex destructor. Oh, oh, he had a, he I had a different them up. nickname, which I won't repeat. Yeah, he had a little um, nickname that, yeah, could get us censored on YouTube. <laughs> Travis, um, g'day, Travis. Thank you, mate. Um, loving the YouTube live, you have been doing not a problem, mate. Okay, another one. Hey, Shane, yeah, I'll have another one. A web Anish, yep. Sorry if I'm butchering that. Um, how he asked, Can you grow figs or passion fruits in an aquaponic system without yes. the use of nutrients? Um, no, not. Not really. I know there's there's a lot of people, um, some more known people who have put out ads and, and promotional stuff saying all you need to do is add fish food, isn't it fantastic, you grow fish and all these plants. It's not the case. You, you do need to add extras in, uh, especially fruiting plants can be very heavy on the potassium. Um, phosphate generally isn't an issue, but potassium in particular. So you will find that if you're growing large numbers of them, you will have to add some of that in. Uh, there are systems like the IAVS, the original um, big mega commercial system that a lot of, um, sorry, I just stuffed up there big time, not IAVS, um, University of Virgin Islands, um, uh, their, their original one, they, they had a um, high feeding ratio. So basically what would happen is um, it would go into a, a big uh, mineralization chamber filter, uh, for want of a bigger, better word, and there was so much nutrients going in that there was adequate uh, other uh, elements, all elements the plant wanted going through into the um, hydroponic side of things. Uh, they were only doing greens though as well. Um, so they didn't find they needed to add anything in from memory. Um, to tell you the truth though, I haven't looked at the studies and the papers and the reports that they've produced. I've just done anecdotal reading on um, UVI system. There, I got it right. Um, 
But when you're looking at uh, fruiting plants, like if you've got a, a row of tomatoes and that's all you're growing and you will have higher potassium demands than just a leafy green bed. So I would suggest that you would need to supplement at least potassium, um, if not all the other uh, micro elements as well at some point uh, to have healthy passion fruit, especially uh, knowing how big passion fruits can get. Um, I've seen them take over massive gum trees, eucalypt trees. Uh, they, they will just keep growing as long as you give them uh, nutrients and water. Um, so, yeah, they do get rather large. Figs, um, I can't see why you couldn't grow figs in aquaponics. I'm sure I would have seen photos just drawing through different forums and groups and pages of figs growing in aquaponics. Um, I think um, Owen said yesterday he's growing figs, but I don't know if it's in aquaponics. I don't think it is. I think that was just in soil. Um I've grown mulberries and uh, aquaponics to a point and they started to fruit, but I had to take it out and just got a little yes. bit too big. Yes. yes. But um, what's his face has got four four trees? Oh, yeah. Um, guy here in Ipswich, he's got papaya trees in growing in blue metal, lets the chicken scratch around the top and he's running fish. <laughs> he's had to hold them up with um, yeah, he's, car straps. Yeah, he's got so, car straps keeping them vertical and they're taller than his um, yeah. double-storey house. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can grow them in there. Uh, it just comes down to, I think he's got just the papayas, one in every bed, and I think from memory he had 2,000-litre fish tank on either end, and I know he stocked a little bit higher than I do, um, and I think he had round about, there would have been 50 to 80 fish in every tank. So a lot more feed going in as I was saying before. So a lot of those elements that you would normally have to add in were probably there just because of the bulk amount of food going in there and also to the chickens scratching around on the top and depositing their waste as they were picking out the worms from the grow bed. So I would put your name said again. Yep. Um, he understands okay, Paul. leafy greens do well on aquaponics, but he'd also like to know what other crops grow in aquaponics without the use of added nutrients. But I suppose everything is going to need an added nutrients because the fish isn't complete. Yeah, the fish isn't complete, so you will have to um, have some added nutrients going in there. I mean, even even things like calcium, you'll find, um, depending on how, it, it all comes down to, like, how much fish feed goes in, how many feed you've got to warrant that amount of fish feed, um, the plant's requirements. Uh, you'll find leafy greens just don't require that much. Fruiting plants are more complex, obviously. They're making a, um, a reproductive body that needs a lot more elements going into it. Um, so, yeah, it, it's just one of those things. Uh, herbs are generally, I've seen people grow basil with not much issue. Um, most of the time you see um, plant deficiencies that will be on the basil and it'll be iron or magnesium show up. Um, so they're two other things that aren't in great amounts uh, left over from the fish assimilating it. So... Yeah, um, there will always be some sort of element that you need to add in. And Paul said, G'day, Paul. Haven't spoken to you for ages. Uh, Paul said, um, figs. He's grown figs in systems. But, and, uh, but they're very heavy feeders, and you need to watch the nutrient imbalance yeah. eventually. So there you go. And Shane, um, thank just you, mate. above that, said he'd also uh, grown figs in the aquaponics, and the fruit doesn't taste as good as in the ground. There you go. And the fig blocks oh. siphons. Siphons, yeah. Yeah. Uh, same as the sweet potatoes, we did uh, not sweet potatoes, yeah, sweet potatoes, and we tested it between the ones in the ground. The ones oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, the pints tasted washed out and watery. Yeah. So I have, I have grown um, sweet potatoes again. Video coming tonight, sweet potato trim back. I have grown sweet potatoes in the aquaponics before in our very first system, um, rooted them in the grow bed themselves. We got some uh, piddly little tubers like this, uh, probably about three or four of them yeah, from memory. They were, they were a bit crud. But the vine grew down into the ground, and where it rooted into the ground, we got massive, like that round's probably about that long, in the, or that round in the middle, and then they taper off. Um, yeah, we got massive sweet potatoes in the ones in the, from the ones in the ground, and yeah, so they're getting the best of both worlds. They're getting nutrients from underneath the mango tree, with lots of detrius falling, breaking down, leaves falling, um, breaking down, becoming humus, 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 um, humus underneath. And um, feeding the plants that way, and they're getting the constant nitrogen and water from the aquaponics. So, um, I actually mentioned in the video um, that's going live tonight that, again, if I had a different system, different um, layout, I really would like to do a bit of a hybrid where we do that again and test it out properly. Have sweet potatoes growing in the bed, have one vine going down into the soil, have another vine going down into, say, a pouch or a pot that I've fed up with rock minerals and something like that, and just see if um, the potatoes that form at those different um, leaf junction terminus, if they do perform better in different uh, mediums.
but uh, then again, it wouldn't be a complete scientific study, of course, because um, the plant would be drawing nutrients from everywhere and sharing it around the plants. But yeah, something I'd like to have a crack at. Right. You have a few questions. Sorry. I have a few questions. Okay. Please snap it. I'll I'll try and keep them short. Sorry, folks. Uh, Jason says, "Would I need a biofilter for a chop and flip?" Um, you don't need to buy a filter for a chop and flip. Get yourself a bucket, a couple of fittings. I've got a video. Um, it's a DIY canister video. It'll be in the playlist that I have linked below this, I think. It's a um, starting an aquaponics system playlist. Basically, a, a bucket. You can use anything from um, shade cloth, um, bird netting, anything that packs in fairly tight and creates um, surface area for the minerals to get trapped on. And um, basically, that'll capture the solids and the clean water will enter the top or the bottom or however you um, decide to set the settler up. I think it's better to have the water go in the bottom and then let the solids, because of gravity, will tend to collect there and then the clean water exit through the top into your system. Um, very cheap, very easy. I've seen people build, actually go out, use a cheap bucket or a tote or something like that, and then go out and buy either aquarium matting or aquaculture matting and use that as the filter medium. medium. Uh, Dacron, is that what you call your stuffing? Um, yeah, the the pillow, stuffing. pillow stuffing. I've seen people use that. It's very hard to clean out though. So you're basically wasting something. Um, the aquarium filter matting you can clean that hose that out same with the shade cloth and whatnot so yeah um, have a crack at something like that first before you go out and actually buy a filter but you can buy aquarium filters are you going to do another collab with Hucho? am i going to i would love to do another collab with Hucho. we haven't chatted recently i really should give him another text and see how he's traveling um yeah i really do like to would like to do one i'd actually like to have him down here just to set up a basic nft rail system with me because we do have the rails and coming into winter i think the water temperature will be a little bit more stable in an nft uh through our winter growing um, season even though we've had probably one of the mildest winters oh sorry summers i can ever remember knock on wood um yeah um yeah, don't want to jinx myself. Um, yeah, we tend to do all the greens through um, winter. So I'd like to, um, yeah, get Hucho's input on that. And we will bring a video to YouTube for that. And hopefully one day I'll convince him to throw a couple of fish in his system. Okay. Here's a good one from um, Raj from Cambodia. Yep. He's doing some research on scalable aquaponics. And what he's finding is it's very difficult to do is get realistic comparative yields to soil farming yes. for any crops. Yes, um, I've seen a number of people ask this question on the Backyard Aquaponics Forum and also the um, uh, groups online. Um, uh, a top group is Aquaponics Anonymous for you folks who want to delve down into the nitty gritty a bit. Um, I know things have sort of slowed down there post-wise. Oh, well, I'm not getting notifications. That's probably face palm. Um, stuffing that system up again. Um, but there's a lot of nitty gritty research that Matthias has put in the file section. Um, commercial growers are, uh, have in the past been lobbying in and helping people out there. And I'm sure I have seen some comparisons. Um, it pretty much all comes down to the same comparison as hydroponic first soil. If you manage your extra nutrients correctly, um, you can basically use the same comparison comparisons but then you're sort of drifting away from what people think is the pure aquaponics of just fish feed and just a few supplements um, i know there are people out there who will use hydroponic based supplements because basically you know you want the most you want to grow the most nutritious plant you can i mean anyone can grow um you know, you can do it in the kitchen we're doing it at the moment we bought shallots chop the green off and you've got the base of the shallot or people call them our green onions um, you pop that in some water and they'll grow more greens. But what nutrients are they really getting? All they're getting is H2O and whatever the government put in their water supply. Um, so that's all they're getting. But you can grow a crop. I can guarantee you if you do a nutrient valuation on that um, green onion versus what I grow in the aquaponics, the aquaponics is going to blow it out of the water. And then again, if I, in my no-dig garden that's probably about five or six years old, has had layer upon layer of compost in it, a diverse um, soil biota in there, uh, fungi, um, bacteria, my other microorganisms, that's probably going to have a higher nutrient content again than what's in the aquaponics. So, I mean, it depends on how far down you want to delve into it. Um, but, yeah, um, it is pretty hard to find the comparison straight off a bit again um but yeah if you're on face palm um have a look at the aquaponics anonymous group you can look in there and different universities and maybe even extension offices in the us um, may have some information on that as well so sorry it's not something i can help you with directly and give you a, a definite link 
Uh, Seymour says, of all the systems that you've built, which one are you most proud of? Um, probably my last system, but also embarrassed by it as well because I didn't take Paul Van's um, 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 advice. I basically turned it into what I would call a basic DIY backyard system. He had it plumbed up as an aquaculture system. It was a um, decoupled system that ran the fish in one side, and then he filled up wicking beds or earthen beds. Um, he coined them as earthen beds because of the way he plumbed them up. So they're different from a standard wicking bed, so i got to give him that. Um, and I basically butchered it, turned it into a, a constant height, uh, what do they call it, single loop or split flow, or basically where you have um, solids um, coming on all your water and solids coming out at one point, um, up through the top, and then into some filtration and back into the sun tank where it split and goes around. Um, I really... I thought that system ran well, had two different tanks on there, never had any real dramas with the filtration side of it. The plant side of it ran fine, um, plumbing-wise and all the rest of it. I did stuff up with the outlets coming out of the two fish tanks. I ran them as 190 mil pipe, uh, the full length, and had my 2-inch, 3-inch, 90 mil pipe. Um, it's not quite the same um, measurement-wise, but you Aussies know why. Um, then the two-inch or 50 mil lines coming down into that communal drain, and I found a lot of solids deposited out. Um, if I'd listened to my um, advice or the advice I got, I probably would have run two 50 mils to a point and then maybe a larger um, communal right near the filter and then have that flow up into the radial flow settler, just mainly because I was constantly every... Every time I cleaned the filter, I had to waste water to try and flush the solids out of those lines. Smaller diameter pipe all the way to the settler would have given me greater velocity. Um, but other than that, that was pretty much all the silter, uh, silter system I was most um, pleased with. I'm trying to talk fast so I can get as much in as I can. Um, so play me back on a reduced speed if you watch this later on. And g'day, Lee. Um, I might give you a PM later on this afternoon, Lee, depending on what goes on around the house here. See Hi. what I can do. Bianca said, G'day, Lee, if you didn't hear her. Um, drink time. Sorry, folks. Yes, have a drink because you've got uh, a whole heap of questions. I've got a whole heap of questions. She's um, laughing. Oh, big shout out and thanks to Bianca, too, by the way, for helping me. Yeah. You should see what I've got to do to repay her, though. You get back there, Lee. Um, Lost it. I've made you lose it, haven't I? It's about German crayfish. German crayfish? Never heard of German crayfish. No, I know. That was from... Yeah, I know there are um, crustaceans Mar all around crabs. the world. Mar what? Marmal crabs? I'm butchering that big time. Marmal crabs. Mar I like that. Mar um, I've never heard. I do know. Pardon me. There are um, crayfish all around the world, but I have I haven't heard of anyone in Europe using anything other than. Um, Apparently, uh, shrimp. They, they, so. they survive in high nutrient levels. Oh, okay. Well, I've lost the question. I'm sorry. Ah. Good one, Rajesh. I hope, yeah, I hope you can find it, mate. Um, oh, I found it. She's found it. There is an urban myth. Oh, it's an urban myth. Oh, okay. Called Mama Crepe which prosper in nutrient-rich water. Have you heard about it? So no, I haven't. So no, I go. haven't. There, there we go. go. Um, hey, Big Sky. G'day, Ian. How's it going, mate? Um, just signed up, so I've missed the start. Anywho, my question, can I enter through the top of a... Sorry. Um, anywho, my question, stop moving, chat. I know, that's why I keep losing bits. Um, can I enter through the top to an IBC uh, to a thousand liter slow filter and send it through the so oh so you want to enter through the top of a radial flow and then have it yes um, check out Mr um, Rob from Bigelow Brook Farm he has a diffusion plate he uses in his he delivers it in through the top because it was just more convenient and it does make sense um, it's another thing I'd like to try at some point in time um, I think he 3D printed something up but I played around with it. And I just cut out, when I was trying to work out how I could do it here, I just cut out a um, piece from a 200-litre uh, drum lid that I'd chopped off for a filter for mum um, before I stuffed it up and just made a diffusion plate from that. Um, and then you just use some stainless steel bolts to have your... And a, uh, like the um, 
drain fitting on the base of my um, solid settler. Just set up something like that, and it gives you a little bit of a, um, a gap. Um, I'm not explaining this very well. What I'll do, Ian, and everyone else, I will link to a um, video I did for the quarantine tank when we got the fish for the system. Um, and I showed a little attachment I made there that went into the top of a netting based and K1, it was K1 in the end, um, filtration system. And I used the same sort of dispersion plate. Or you can just go straight to Rob's channel and look up his most current radial flow settler build videos. And yeah, you'll see. You'll see what I'm talking about there. So, cheers, Ian. Okay. Uh, Max. Thanks for the support too, by the way. Max Hewitt said he's just started building an aquaponic system. Thanks to you. Just trying to be 100% self-sufficient by growing, growing, producing all fish food. Sweet. And pH adjusters. Yep. Any tips on homemade ways to make things? Um. Well, nutrients to the system, um, compost teas and those sort of brews, aerated are a great way to add some extra elements in for your fish. Um, there's different ways you can uh, make your own potash um, if you want to go totally self-sufficient, um, baking bones and that sort of thing. Um, so look that up uh, for homemade nutrient supplements. And it just doesn't have to apply to aquaponics because there's a lot of people out there, biodynamic farmers and um, organic growers. A lot of those folks will try and make their own nutrients when they can. Uh, a lot of people, where it's legal, I know some parts of Australia it's not, um, collecting seaweed from the beach and they can make up their own nutrient brews doing that. So that's on the plant side of things. For the fish feed, comes down to fish selection. Um, please don't try and grow food in the aquaponic system that is going to be the main food for the fish. Grow the food for the fresh fish outside the system. That way you're bringing nutrients into the fish and you're not recycling nutrients round and round and round. Um, you can grow duckweed in small ponds um, for omnivorous or herbivores, um, black soldier fly larvae for certain fish, um, garden worms, earthworms, earthworm farms, mealworms, crickets. Um, there are a load of insects that you can grow. Uh, do keep in mind, though, that commercial feed is formulated to give um, what they claim is the optimal feed and nutrients for the fish. So it's, you. I don't, not a scientist, again, obviously you can understand that. Um, you can't, you probably can't get all your nutrients from a bit of duck way, duckweed and a handful of garden worms. Um, every week um try and be as diverse as you can in the nutrient in the um the the critters and the, the plant sources you're putting in there i mean even things like the common garden weed per slain um high in omega-3 so if you're an aussie and you're trying to boost the levels of omega-3 in your uh, jade perch say um they can only uh, take take on board the omega-3 that's given to them as i understand it so um Oh, any fish really silver perch have high omega-3 as well um feed them things like the purse lane and try and boost them up um yeah just try and be as diverse as you can if you want to become self-sufficient just so the fish and the plants get the best of both worlds so hope that helps a bit said, can we add sea salt to grow beds so i'm wondering if this is oh sea salt the grow beds or the fish tank or yeah no i'd any nutrients that you want to give the plants, I would add directly into the either your mineralizer if you're running your mineralizer offline to try and help it more become more bioavailable, or directly into the grow beds itself. I like to put it in um, as far away from the outlet as I can, so it spends as much time as it can in the grow bed itself. Um, I've added things like uh, potassium silicate. Um, which when I've done tests outside the system, just shoot the pH up through the roof. Um, so what I tend to do if I'm adding something like that in that I don't want to boost the pH uh, dramatically in one hit, uh, what I'll do is I'll take the bell off the siphon, I'll add it in at the, um, uh, the furthest point, which is the water inlet, and then just let it um, sit in the bed as long as it can, maybe for a couple of hours, just let that water turn it basically into a constant um, flood bed and just let that um that nutrient dilute down to a point where it won't affect the ph but and it also stays in there longer for the uh, plants to take up and eventually your ph will self-adjust back to where oh. it needs to be anyway so um that is that is one thing that i do um but other people use drip feeders as well um so yeah I, most people just pop that straight into their sump tank though so 
That's interesting. That helps. Just going back to that other question, Liberty Not Lic Licensed just said his, uh, sorry, his, her friend had excellent success for many years with an AP feeding perch, only duckweed yeah. and dry cat food. There you go. Um, and I know uh, Bruce from Aussie Fish, he had a bit of a crack at me saying, why aren't I giving leftover like um, potatoes and pumpkin and things like oh, that? An egg. An egg that into the... Fingerlings. Yeah, fingerlings. Um, um, Bruce's gorgeous wife um, said that they uh, crushed up the um, the eggs and just put them through the tanks, uh, boiled eggs. And yeah, that's the that's way that they added extra nutrients into the tank, not only for the plants, but more importantly for the fish. Um, so that's, yeah, um, yeah. Probably should delve into that a little bit more in the video. Yeah, the different yeah, food. Different food. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's one I'll look at doing for sure. I have been putting it off for years, mainly because it's hard. Um, I hope you folks can understand. Um, Self-taught. It's hard to get scientific knowledge. I, I don't want to lead people astray with a lot of this stuff. And when it comes down to the dietary requirements for fish, I have basically no idea other than the layman um, knowledge that I picked up reading papers and speaking to uh, folks who have done things like this. Um, so that's that's one thing I'll I'll, um, I'll, I'll um, have a good chat to Bruce because, you know, being a hatchery man, um, he'll have a little bit of insight into that and speak to a few other people as well and see what I can come up with. So I suppose that's a good link to... Um... Uh, John Hobson said he's... Um... Sorry, he only recently joined. Join. Indeed. Yep. He's looking to do a standard three bed thousand litre sump tank and filter like video, and he's in Harvey Bay. With yep. similar weather. Where we want to go. Do you recommend? So I'm just thinking. Yeah, Harvey Bay. Yeah, yeah, Jade Perch, Golden Perch, um, Silver Perch. Have um, a chat to Bruce. Have a chat to Bruce. Yeah. Um, Aussie Fish. Um, probably. Um, I know he's not, he's a very busy man, so I wouldn't just ring him up and say, hey, can we chat aquaponics? Not a good idea. But when it comes to your fish selection, uh, be a um, uh, fantastic aquaculture. He knows the world about. Um, so, yeah, when it comes to fish selection, it wouldn't wouldn't pay, hurt to um, give um, Aussie Fish a call and see what they recommend and even drive out there and pick them up. If he allows it, I'm not too sure what requirements are going on with the world at the moment. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd actually, Golden Perch is one that I'd like to have a crack at. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, ask Bruce, see what he'd recommend for your area. I can pretty much all guarantee he's going to say Jade Perch just because they're pretty much all bulletproof from what I've found out, so or my experience. Um, Weed never killed Kenny, said. Have you raised catfish or bluegill? If so, anything to know beforehand. Um, no bluegill here because I'll probably get done by biosecurity for importing them. Um, very strict biosecurity rules here. Um, so I haven't. We do have a little Tandanus um, eel tailed catfish, is about this big, and they've just got an eel tail. Uh, apparently, they're supposed to be one of the better eating fish for aquaponics or aquaculture in general. Uh, bluegill, I do know a lot of folks in the States have used bluegill, uh, they use them all the time. Um, so, yeah. Um, Apparently they work fine. Channel catfish, I know people use um, channel catfish a fair bit. Uh, Michael, who's on here right at the start, I know he's got some. Um, yeah, and apparently you can grow them together, as someone else mentioned earlier on in the feed. So, um, this is an interesting one. Yep. So, Kate Cameron Chandler said, Ever used have you ever used the eggshells and vinegar to get more calcium in the system? And would you recommend it? Uh, no, I don't, um, mainly because uh, the, the way our systems run, I need to get a lot of either hydroxides or carbonates or bicarbonates in there daily, and I just don't have enough. I have seen people do the different calcium extractions using um, eggshells. There's different ways you can do it. I've seen people that just bake them uh, basically to make sure there's no salmonella and then just crush them up into a very fine powder in a mortar and pestle or in a food processor and just add them as a calcium. Um, I find I, I need to adjust the pH on a daily basis. At the, in, oh, I've got nothing really to show you, but uh, no joke, uh, say, or dessert spoon pile that high with calcium hydroxide is what I'm putting in daily for... What I work out round about, um, it's a cup, a standard metric cup's worth of feed, actually a little bit over that. So roughly round about um, 250 grams worth of feed a day, easy. Um, so that's just how much nitrification is going on in the system and how much alkalinity is being stripped. So as the alkalinity falls, so will your pH, not the same, they are different. Um, so that's why I have to just keep adding it in at that rate. So 
Um, eggshells, yeah, depends on the side of your system. You might be able to get away with that, but yeah, um, not something that I've done myself. Bianca, um, she's on the phone. Sorry. What are you on? Sorry. Face palm? No, no. Text message. Messages. Okay. Your daughter's are messaging me. Um, so Travis says I started a new um, AQ. Will be a ingrown unit in a hoop house. We'll share pics as the build goes. Cool. He has a large temperature swing, so using the elk to hold yes. temps. What do you think? Great idea. Um, uh, let us know, Travis. Are you the Travis who's been a supporter and been along to the hangouts? If so, give us he a thumbs up. He is green. Up. He is green. Yep. Cool. Um, there's been a few Travises. Just curious. Travis um, C. Travis C. Um, yeah, I reckon using the earth to your advantage is um, great. Um, it, it helps keep the water stabilized. I mean, a lot of you people um, who are into the different um, sustainable living um, groups and maybe subscribe to channels here on youtube we'll see whole greenhouses that are heated and cooled using the earth basically burying pipes have air circulating through it and it warms up the greenhouse through winter and cools it down through summer i think in some areas of counties in england it's actually mandatory um, to have that sort of um, cooling system in, and heating system installed in new builds um, from watching a documentary years ago. Um, so definitely a great idea, even with water. The same thing works with water. If you can keep your tank underground, even running your pipes underground, does help to keep your uh, water temperature more stable, uh, warmer in winter and cooler in summer. Um, so that's, yeah, definitely a fantastic idea. Um, I'd like to have something like that here. Unfortunately, I could manage to get the sump in the ground probably around about a foot and a half, and that was about it because we went under a mango tree, massive roots, and I wasn't about to um, cut through them just to stick a sump in. So definitely a great idea. Even better if you can do it with your fish tank if you're living in extreme areas. I know a lot of the guys in the Middle East who were doing um, the IAVS, that's the um, sand gardening aquaponic system, um, they have their fish ground, fish tanks in the ground, basically dig out a hole, reinforce the sides, a bit of pond liner in there, and that does help um, to keep the water more stable in those more extreme um, climates. So, yeah, go for it, mate. And I'd love to see the results if you want to hop on a stream sometime, a hangout, that'd be fantastic. Um, I'm not pronouncing that. Must, yeah, Okay. Rob, love your channel. Just wondering, what would you recommend doing in order to add phosphorus into the system? Phosphorus, generally, um, phosphorus isn't a huge issue. I do know some people will add in rock phosphate, though. Um, I'm, it's not something I've I've had a lot to deal with, mainly because I've never really seen a, defi a deficiency in the leaves of the plants. In saying that, um, I'm on the wrong computer. I can quickly look up what my results were. Um, for the lab test we got done, but I, I haven't had to add any in. I do know some people have used hydroponics forms of phosphate uh, to boost it in their systems as to which one, I'm not too sure. And I have seen people crush up um, the Ross fo uh, rock phosphate and add it into their system. So um, yeah, it's a bourbon rub. Is that a, no, it's not a bourbon. Sorry, getting distracted Ian. Um, yeah, sorry mate. Um, yeah, add, adding it in like that is something you probably couldn't hurt just to do a quick Google search because I, I haven't looked into it myself, mainly because I haven't had to. And um, the people that have added it have added it in, in the hydroponic form. Um, so, um, yeah. Sorry, I can't be of much help there. Paul just said the, food, the fish food usually provides... More than enough, yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's what I pretty much will find. Uh, actually, I in suppose so if you're not feeding them commercial fish food, though... Yeah, it's still an issue. can be an issue. I just yeah. rem I actually do remember someone saying that they added Rooster Booster, uh, which is a um, an organic green frog branded, I think, um, dynamic lifter. And I think he said he literally added a dozen pellets of the Rooster Booster pellet under the inlet. Uh, the problem with that is it also has high nitrogen, ammonia and other forms of nitrogen um, levels in it as well. But he just put that in his media bed and that's what he was doing. And he said he did. Yeah, uh, because apparently it's high in phosphate as well. I don't know what the MPK um, ratio was, but yeah, just something I'm sort of remembering in the back of my mind. Um, Antonia said, "Did you know molasses will kill ants and sap sucking insects?" I that's one so, thing that that's some one thing that we're, I weren't straight up getting into aquaponics. That was supposedly the go-to 
at the time for sap sucking, sucking insects and whatnot. Uh, we sprayed it on the system and I got the non sulfur as well to make sure it was um, apparently that's what you needed for the, the compost brews at the time. So that's what I bought. And I had no luck with it whatsoever. Um, I've heard people say they have fantastic luck with it. It's the same as the diatomaceous earth. I've sprayed aphid colonies again and again and again with diatomaceous earth and I haven't knocked them back at all. Yet other people tell me they have great success with it. So um, I just have to default what other people have said. If it works for you, go for it. Um, I haven't found that it worked for us on ours here. Um, so, yeah. Uh, same with sea salt. Someone told me that sea, they use sea salt as a pest control because um, someone at a course recommended it to them. I've, I have, at the beginning, I did a lot of foliar feeding and I had no, still had the same aphids, grasshoppers and caterpillars um, with or without it. So just anecdotally for me, uh, it hasn't worked. Okay, so Liberty, not licenses. Um, hey, hairy man. Uh, I want to run a backyard pond of approximately 6,000 gallons through Oi. 10 IBC grow beds. Do you think it's possible to balance my fish load sufficiently low to run solar only? I don't think you're going to have uh, 6,000 gallons, was it? 6,000 gallons through 10 IBC grow beds. That's, that's a heck of a lot of water, and um, I'd say you would have very dilute um, nutrients for so if you're talking about the normal foot high grow bed um, um doo -doo 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 -doo. so you're probably going to have about biofiltration for 12 plus whatever biofiltration is in the um, pond so 120 fish and 6,000 liters I don't know if that's going to generate enough nutrients for you um, to run um, to run sufficiently just out of curiosity, I'm converting gallons. So what we're looking at there is 22,000 litres. Yeah, no, I'd, I think you're going to be hard-pressed to get a decent nutrient load in there. Um, please correct me in the chat if you think I'm wrong because uh, you're looking at around about square meterage or square IBC per IBC. You're looking at anywhere between 20 to 120 grams worth of feed. Um, and if you extrapolate that back backwards to fish uh, amount of fish, you're really not going to have... A lot of nutrients basically the nutrients are going to be very dilute in that volume of water so maybe you know turn that into a nice um koi pond or something like that and just buy say a thousand gallon tank um and then stock that with fish and then yeah um that that would run that system fairly well and the fish should have more than enough room so hope that's helped hope i haven't put a bummer on you on your um, plans mate but yeah um just, I think it'd just be too dilute, personally. So Rick has asked, have you ever tried wood chips in a floating media filter? No, I haven't. I've seen people um, use it for the uh, same as logs in aqua uh, in um, aquariums to um, just adjust pH. I have seen some people say that they were going to make grow beds, uh, use it as grow bed media, and hopefully it would compost down and provide other nutrients to the plants. Uh, the first thing I'd have um, issues with it would release a lot of tannins into the water and be very hard to see your fish. And I like to be able to see my fish for fish health reasons. Um, I know other people aren't too concerned about that, but it's something that I'm concerned about. And it would depend on what other chemicals are leaching through um, into the system. Not something I've done a lot of research on. I know people have run um, wood chipping, pardon me, wood, driftwood and things like that in their systems with no problems. But yeah. Um, I can't see how it would help too much in the filtration system other than it would provide media for the solids to be caught in and biological surface area. It'd be interesting to see how you go if you give it a crack, though. So um, the, the Deardorff family, um, they said they're having a hard time finding fingerlings in California. Yep. Um, but they had a question about harvesting, so I was just thinking if there's anyone in California that could yep. point out where fingerlings get from? I think um, you have to be you have to have the um, the the male only tilapia is the hybrid I think in California and I'm not too sure about licenses and whatnot I, I just that's in the back of my mind so but, um, after a harvest how yep. and when do you introduce new fingerlings into the system well you can introduce new fingerlings into the system um, while you still got fish in there if you want um, basically you can make up a little netted basket 
and keep your fingerlings in them um, off to one side in the tank, depending on the, the um, orifice in the top of the tank. Some people just cut out a little square um, of an IBC. Um, we use a laundry basket with some uh, fly screen mesh zip tied to the inside, not the outside. That way the fish don't get in between the two and crushed. Um, and just had that floating in the aquaponic system. Or you can have them in a, an aquarium outside the system, maybe running through the same filtered system so they're used to the same water, and then introduce them once they're large enough that the other fish won't eat them or um, wait till the other fish are harvested. You can, we found with our system, we went quite a while in between um, fish. Afterwards, I just used the fish emulsion to add nutrients into the system. And then when it was time to add the fingerlings in, they just went straight in, didn't end up really didn't end up with plant deficiencies that I remember other than iron being an issue, but I constantly had iron issues with the system because as you've probably seen and you'll see with the sweet potatoes, I do let some plants get a little bit out of control and they do suck a lot of nutrients out of the system. So, um, yeah, it, you can add them in um, while the fish, uh, the current stocking, uh, the, the current stock of fish are in there, either in a little isolated basket or in a tank to one side, fingerling tank, um, yeah, so it's it's you just got to get a little bit creative. I definitely wouldn't add them in. I've added in um, firetail gudgeons into the, the surplus to our needs into the jade perch tank, and I think they lasted all of five seconds. I think one made it out uh, alive because he was sucked through. Yeah, he made it into the sump, but um, yeah, the rest the rest pretty much will just smash straight through by the jade perch. Same as when we've added yabbies or crayfish in there. Um, so yeah, thank cohabitate too well with Jade Perch. Yeah, so um, one of the other questions, I suppose, which link, could link to that is, do different fish require a different space? Have you ever tried mixed tropic, tropic layers like catfish and Jade Perch or algae eaters or mosquito fish? Yeah, um, mosquito fish wouldn't survive with the Jades, um, as I just said. Yeah. The um, I do know people who do keep mixed species in their tanks. And as pretty much well, as long as they have a, a fairly constant growth rate, it generally isn't an issue. Uh, it's it's when you mix different sizes fish, you you will generally have problems. On actually, bass, you might have issues with bass because I know their mouths, yeah, they they can take quite a large prey. Um, same with barramundi as well, which is a um, sea bass. Um, you will end up with if you have mis mismatched size fish you will end up with some sort of predation um but it comes down to i suppose aggressive species like some species will have habitat requirements um where they they basically like to defend a certain area and that transfers into tank culture at some point um but then that can be counteracted by stocking densities stocking ratios if you increase the number of fish um you tend to cut down on um having issues with um territorial fish i know silver perch apparently they they have issues with bullying in a tank and jade perch do too as we found out if your stocking rates are too low so um yeah Something you're going to have to look into species um, specific um, to what you're wanting to stock in your system. But um, yeah, algae eaters, I do know a lot of people will have a, a single pleco in climates that can handle them, of course, or catfish um, that will just eat the algae on the side of the tank. And as long as um, the other fish aren't too big, um, they tend to get along fine. So from what I've seen. Ah, more water. Yes. Um We'll probably only go for about another 15 minutes, if that's all right. Another 15 minutes? Cool, not a problem. Okay, what do you think about Rob's inline mineralization system? Uh, it seems to do really well for him. Um, something, yeah, it looks to do really well. Uh, you'd probably have to ask um, Rob his opinion on it as well. I don't know how recently he's done an update, update on it. I haven't seen anything on Patreon or elsewhere on it. Um, uh, uh, it works, apparently. Uh, yeah, I, I can't really fault it. I haven't seen the ins and outs of it. I haven't seen any um, um, results from it. Um, yeah, it's, it's chugging along fine. There are other people who have inline systems as well that I've seen online. Uh, I think, though, theirs might be theirs might be a more traditional one. Um, whose channel was it? It was one of the big garden channels on YouTube, visited an aquaponics farm. Um, epic gardening it may have been and his was semi in line uh, went straight from the solid settler uh, into the into the mineralization tank 
um, segregated from the system. Bubbler, this is from memory, Bubbler um, aerates the system or it might have been a pump, um, Venturi driven, I can't recall the ins and outs of it. Then every morning, let it settle or periodically through the day, let it settle, clean water discharged into the system, next load of solids dumped into it. So there's various ways you can do it in line. Um, Rob seems to work for him. Um, he knows what he's on about aquaponics wise. So yeah, um, probably have a look at it and see if um, you could have a crack yourself. Um, or ask Rob too. He's, he's a really nice guy. He's pretty open to any um, polite question and conversation. So yeah. Larry, I've just seen Larry only use Koi these days, but you can buy tilapia fingers online and they're always shipped overnight FedEx. Yeah. Cool. How does Koi taste, Larry? <laughs> Bony, apparently. Aren't Bony, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, Forrest has asked uh, his planning in New Mexico this year. He'll probably start small. Yeah. But I have an unused in-ground pool. Is it worth working with the pool as a fish pond? Again, I don't think so. The nutrient, the nutrient dilution would be fairly massive. Um, if you've got a pool or a large pond that you, I should have mentioned this before. If you've got a pool or a large pond that you want to use, how about just using it as a straight aquaculture system? Um, I've seen people who have in ground. They're basically a big a sustainable movement of um, converting your pool into a living pond or a living pool. Basically, you throw your your crayfish in there, your your perch. Um, I think I've seen them with like little jetties. Yeah, have a little, yeah, yeah, well, they're a natural pool. Yeah. yeah, and have your water plants around the outside. Maybe use the water to irrigate um, some garden beds off to one side. A little bit of nutrient will make it out there. Um, but a lot of water plants, I mean, there's loads of edible water plants you can grow as well. And they, um, yeah, they basically treat it as, as something like that. Great for your own, for your own use. Um, not something I think you could really turn into a commercial model in the backyard or a, a, like a sustainable like food production if you're after the plant side as well um we did, but, we did see those ones where they reduced the pool's water by about 50 percent. yeah like the yeah the garden what's the garden pool and then um had the, the rim of the pool and outside the pool was garden beds that flowed in yeah so hopefully you guys can hear bianca um the Garden pool, I'm fairly sure. They've got Black Soldier Fly Farm um, tutorials, chicken tutorials, all sorts of tutorials on there. But they basically lowered the volume. I think they're in Nevada, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, so they lowered the volume in the pool, used that deeper end of the pool as the fish pond, then pumped up to various aqua, um, hydroponic areas within um, along the side of the pool and maybe even outside from memory. And they created a greenhouse over the top. Um, so they had that sunken, um, um, being sunken, different sun aspects, uh, which helped keep it cooler from memory, and also just the, the thermal mass below the ground. And, yeah, they, they turned a pool into a living greenhouse, which means they could put other stuff in there as well, just not the aquaponics. You could have your worm farm in there if you're in a hotter climate. Um, so that's another way to utilise the pool. Thanks, B. Uh, Travis said, um, going to have around... Thanks, Larry. 560 cubic feet of grow bed space how large or a tank in gallons should i plan on i was going for 3000 can you just repeat that please because i was okay. reading something down the side how so many gallons he's going to have around 560 cubic feet of grow bed space yep how large a tank in gallons should he plan on he was looking at 3,000. Um, sorry, I'm just converting feet into litres. How many cubic feet again? Sorry? 560. 560 cubic feet. cubic feet. See, I do this when I edit, so you guys don't, you all think I'm really good at conversion. I'm not. So that's roughly around about 15,000 litres. Is that right? 15,000 litres. 560 cubic feet. Okay, so that's the grow bed space. Yeah. How large a fish tank in gallons? Um, well, the easiest um, just to buy, um, no, because you're, you're, you're working in feet, Math. not gallons. Math. <laughs> um, divided by 20 because it turned it to. About 750 fish you would need 
um, if we're working on um, 500 grams or one pound at harvest. That's a lot of that's a lot of grow bed. Um, so what 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 size grow beds are you using? If you don't mind, actually, this could get very very involved. I was say, if yeah, I might come back to you. To I'll try. Oh, okay, it's Travis. Okay. Um, if you want to hit me up through um, the the members email link, um, I'm quite happy to nut that out online because I like a bit of a brain bender. Um, yeah, we'll work that one out, mate. Not a problem. Okay, so liberty. You not damn metric people. <laughs> Liberty Nut License says, my main concern is obtaining sufficient electricity via solar alone to power yeah. the required pump and aeration. Going to use planted flats on the ground also. Must fence up first, but we'll keep you posted. Cool. So that was his other one. Yep. Um, Hi, Garrowin, by the way. C4, and Gavin. I want to have a split fish tank, one for fingers too small and other for grown for harvest and rotate them in the same tank screened off any issues sorry i can i'm reading the chat i should stop sorry listen to me i'm sorry instead. yes okay um so c4 wants to have a split tank yep fish tank baffled off yep one for fingers too small and others for grown for harvest yep and rotate them in the same tank screened off any issues um no the only make allowances probably go i'll probably drop the water in the fingerling side first and obviously you're going to have some sort of screen in between them um water uh, fingerling side first mainly because their um waste will be smaller in size and it will fit through the screen to the solid side uh, to the larger fish sides and that's where i'd have your solids removal system um i've seen a lot of people they'll have two fish tanks and they'll have fairly large fish in each and the waste from this one goes through a solids lifting overflow into the next fish so these fish get clean water these fish are swimming in sewage and then it's the the waste is concentrated and then taken out again um that's what i just went into the solids yeah removal. yeah so i'd i'd have um if you're going to have a, a screen baffle down the center um into the fingerlings first make sure their waste can be sucked through and um, into the the other fish side where it can then be removed. Um, but if you're doing two tanks, never plumb them together. Um, just best practice to have the solids waste removed separately from each tank into a communal drain or a communal settler and go from there and hopefully the rain won't get too loud. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yep. Um, do you put your fish temporarily in a purge tank before oh, harvesting? Yeah, I saw Paul's. That's yeah. what I was reading before. Um, no, I don't. Um, it's something I've thought about doing in the past the last lot of um fish that we harvested basically were purged just through circumstances for about a week they had no feed which fish can handle quite well uh, as long as they're being fed correctly um there's but, a question you there's a question go. sorry right. you go. um it was in the background it was my backdrop Hello. um sorry no, yeah, we had them. We had them purged um, inadvertently, and we just found that they didn't have that um, that slight muddy flavour that freshwater fish can sometimes have, which is a chemical from. Um, it comes through. I've heard differing um, reports on this. The one that I tend to believe is that it's some sort of bacterial or algal growth within the system that stays in the gut of the fish and goes through into their flesh. Um, other people have said that it's a chemical within the fish feed itself. Yet people who catch fish in the wild have said they get the same flavour. So I don't think people are out there throwing fish food into the natural waterways around here. So, um, yeah, purging purging is something. What we'll probably do is just won't feed them for three or four days beforehand. We'll try it with the first lot of jade perch that come out of the system here, and I'll report back and let you folks know on what it's, going, what it's like. So... Here you go. The question was. Yes. Oh my God, and I've lost it. Um, it was how it was made. Thought. Sorry. How it was made. Oh, it's it's tin. It's just a, tin. Yeah. It's just spot. It looks like they just uses a spot was, weld on tabs. There's a few couple of little spots around the legs, a couple of spots on the back, and a um, 
stoker used to hold it up on the wall, which I probably shouldn't have. Yeah, anyway, um, there you go. We didn't make it. It was something. I think it was a gift. Yeah, it was a gift. So that's our froggy. I won't put him back up. And sorry, I was responding to Jendera. Um, I like that uh, calf is referred to as um, poor man's lobster. Carp? Yeah. Poor man's lobster. Uh, okay. Um, already I've just seen one down there. Six IBC grow beds. How many fingerlings? Depends on the volume of biofiltration you have. Um, so those fingerlings are going to grow up to be large fish. Large fish at harvest is generally taken at about 500 grams because I think you're an Aussie from memory. Um, so 500 grams per 25 litres of clay media. Um, so work it out from there. Um, it's just, as I was saying to Warren yesterday, that is just a rule of thumb that saves people from getting into hassles when they're first starting out. Uh, once you get more experience, I've had experienced aquaponics people telling me that I give you guys a load of bad information when it comes to biofiltration on media beds. Those people aren't taking the cries for help that I get in comment sections and emails and on messages on Facebook and through Instagram of people who have stuffed up their biofiltration because people said, oh, I just throw 100 fish in an IBC, you'll be right. So 25 litres per little fingerling, you want to grow out to 500 gram. That's my um, stock standard and I'll keep telling everyone that. Um, oh, see, I'm responding to someone and then I lose my little my little bits. Poor man's cut lobster has just popped up, Forrest. Yeah. That's how long the delay is. That's why Bianca's here because she's watching this on Facebook. Uh, Facebook. I hate that name. Um, how do you use... Oh, sorry. How? What do you use to lower your pH? I don't... Here in Texas, mine is 8.4. 8 8.4 out of the tap. Um, is that in your system after it's matured or your top off That's water? Rosemary. That's rosemary. Um, hi, rosemary. Um if it's out of your tap and you're topping up an existing system over time, the pH will drop or should drop as long as your media is the correct media and it's not um, carbonate heavy. Um, your pH will drop over time. So in the end, you'll be thankful for that water. Our water is round about the same out of the tap. So when I add it into the system, uh, about 200 litres every four to five days through summer, we're, I'm seeing no rays from that water at all in the overall system pH. It's round about... Um, 1600 litres, which probably does know you, you no good. Um, but if you're starting out a system, um, you could use phosphoric acid or mutric acid, otherwise known as hydro, hydrochloric acid, and punch your pH down to around about 7.2, 7.3. Uh, just do it in little steps at a time and go from there. Um, I personally wouldn't worry about it. If you can cycle your system to begin with, um, add your fish. You are going to have some plant deficiencies to start out with. But as your fish grow in Texas, I take it you'll probably use something like tilapia and they grow fast. Um, the As the water um, become, um, the ammonia is oxidized all the way through to nitrate. A lot of alkalinity is used up by the bacteria and the biota in the system. In that conversion, um, as the alkalinity is used up, your pH will fall. So um, if you're starting out, and you are concerned that it's going to take some while for that pH to drop, um, treat it with the phosphoric acid first. Otherwise, um, just cycle your system as normal. Once you're, you're, you're very confident the system is cycled, add your fish, and over time that pH should drop naturally. And then you'll be, like I said, thankful for the harder water there. So hope that helps. Sorry, Larry just had a good look. Hi, Bruce. He's always been, Larry's always been told that <laughs> high nitrate levels is what causes that muddy taste. Which oh, okay. Tell me that there aren't enough plants in the system. That's interesting. Oh, yep, that's, interested. that's that's quite interesting. Yep. Yeah. Um, Bruce, if you're still there, you might be able to help us out with that. Um, There's a high nitrate associated with a muddy flavour. And I love, Bruce has said this a few times, jade perch and silver perch are happy at a high pH. Um, all they need is wet water. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, she was over in Texas, mate. So um, different, unless you want to ship her a couple of grams worth of jade perch. Um, uh, I saw before Geron asked about builders. Um, yeah, we... I've, I've oh, okay, cool. Yep. yep. 
I'm on it. Don't you worry. Um, Savorn says he's got six IBC grow beds. How many fingerlings? Yeah, I've already answered and that one. It's, it's a volumetric seven. thing. You, you need to know a volume yeah. because, I mean, an IBC, and I've seen people do it a 10 centimetre high IBC because um, they, they will push for room or that's what they saw hydroponic beds at. And so you really need to know. Did um, you see Stephen's comment after that? No, I didn't. No. He's got three, four inch by four inch by, no, four foot by four foot by non metrics. Four by four foot by eight inch grow beds and a 50 gal stock tank with six, eight inch koi. Do you think? I'd have to do the conversion on that. Sorry, mate. Um, if you want to do them in metric, um, yeah, and pop it down. Uh, basically, volume, even volume in gallons, if you can work out the volume in gallons per grow bed and then um, divide that for gallons, you divide it by 6.6 .6, and that gives you um, a fish estimate for the grow bed and you can round up your result. I mean, you can't grow 4.6 fish, so just round it up to five fish. Um so, yeah, you can do it that way. An 8-inch koi, um, that's about 8 inches, I think. Um, maybe smaller. Um, I'm not too sure, but at a guess at that size, they're probably about 150 grams, which I'm not too sure on poundish. Probably uh, just under half a pound. Um, so, yeah, it all... I work on... Just quickly, I work... People have pulled me up on this as well. Um, I work on weight of fish because a weight of fish has a general amount of fish feed they have which is around about anywhere from one to three percent their body weight so what we really want to know is how much fish feed go in um but to make it universal that's why i go on weight of fish because a, a fish at a certain weight generally takes an x amount of percentage of body weight in feed per day um just to help you folks out so um i i it's a rule of thumb everyone uses is just a fish, but what we're really thinking about is um, amount of fish feed. And generally speaking, generally speaking, again to help you with the koi one, um, grams, like Mickey bird, um, grams. Uh, if you're growing leafy greens, anywhere from uh, 20 grams up to around about 40 to 50 grams per square meter. Or if you you people in feet in inches, a um, IBC grow bed. Um, that's what you need for leafy greens and generally above 50 uh, uh, grams um, of feed um, per grow bed um, if you're looking at growing fruiting plants. So, I mean, that's just a an, a ballpark figure because, I mean, the fruiting plant could be one tomato or you could have some wombat who's got 15 tomatoes in the square meter or IBC that are indeterminate and growing 50 foot long out the side. So um, the amount of feed you need really comes back to um, square meterage of plants and then again, what plants are growing, number of plants within that square meterage. Hope that didn't confuse too much. What do you do for nitrate controls during winter when the plants are not growing? Uh, we don't have that problem. <laughs> um, but you can use fish emulsion. Uh, again, if you are adding fish emulsion in, don't pour in a couple of litres or um, half a gallon at a time. And when you do add it in, add it in the start of your biofiltration. So for most people, that'll be the start of your grow bed. Pour that in where the water is. Um, that way it's got some time to be processed by the bacteria before it goes into the sump or the fish tank or wherever it has access to be picked up to and taken out to the fish tank. Okay. Last question. Oh, she's such a killjoy. Yep. <laughs> so ATE Outdoor says, my tanks have some areas on the bottom that are formed out for forklift access. Is there yes. something I should use to fill those sections or can I split up the solids lift between them? I saw a comment like that on Facepalm yesterday. So let us know below if it was you. Sorry, I just scrolled by. There's too many questions there. Um, I was thinking the vacuum that we had for those dead yeah, we, RBC. Yeah, we, we created a vacuum. Um, it's got a hairless rod in it when our kids had two mums. Um, it's basically a vacuum... Um, you Aussies will know what that means. Um, uh, vacuum, it's a pipe that pull off the solids lifting outlet, put on a little adapter plug, um, basically a 50 mil um, fitting. That was them on Facebook. Was them on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, then have a hose with a pipe on the end of it. And we just basically put that down in the bottom of the tank. 
and let that work as a vacuum that then took those solids out through the solids lifting outlet into the radial flow settler. Um, that was a little dodgy thing we made up. Other people will use a, a jiggle siphon or a siphon and just stick a hose in there and collect those solids out if they're a problem. Um, Another thing you can do is just get in there and just give them a bit of a stir around. It freaks the fish out and they don't really like it for some reason, having something stir the water up at the base of the tank. Um, but it is an option you could do. Um, so if you put something in it, you're just going to create another cleaning issue, aren't you? What do you mean? If, like you, if you put something in for the void... Yeah, if you yeah, if you do if you do build it up, there will be unless it's waterproof, you are going to end up with somewhere else for solids to build up. And as the water folks, as the water won't um, cycle through there, there won't be a lot of oxygen, and you'll end up with a bit of an possible anoxic zone down there, which could cause potassium uh, potential um, sulfur release into the water and um, just basically denitrification. Who so, chose online? Who chose on? But we're leaving. Who chose? <laughs> Bianco won't let me stay and play. I scroll down the bottom. Hello, Mr. Hucho. The little sucker. The little sucker. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Um, it would be great to speak to you again, Paul, but I understand you are a busy man. You have a lot going on yourself. Oh, Paul, for those people who have um, asked me about growing wasabi in... Hydro, uh, aquaponics. Uh, Paul is in the northeast of America and has a climate where he can do it, grow it at some times of years. There you go, Hucho. Um, but Hucho grew it um, aquaponically in subtropical Australia uh, for a while until the aphids almost killed it. Go check out Hucho's um, um, wasabi video if you're interested. Um, yeah, um, so it can be done in aquaponics, but it's one of those climate things. Or as Hucho... Um, showed uh, microclimates may have got may not have got a massive yield but it is doable to the point so there we go uh huge shout out before i go to those folks who do support us through the farm your own yard uh patron page uh folks like paul michael who was on earlier a few other people who have popped in as well and also you folks who support us through the youtube membership platform I really do appreciate uh, catching up with you guys on the live stream. Um, let us know if you want me to do more because the times aren't convenient for a lot of folks. Um, as Michael pointed out, last hangout, the uh, well, last, last live stream was like our original patron um, hangouts where we had a dozen people in at a time, sort of dribbled, uh, dwindled down to um, uh, Dave uh, from Veneto Gardens. G'day, Dave. And uh, Michael and ourselves and a few others, like the two Brian's that popped in uh, last time. So... Yeah, come on in. Don't have to talk about aquaponics, any sort of gardening, or even, you know, if you want to talk about um, other bits and pieces, quite happy to have you along. And, yeah, Hucho is stealing a few of the ideas to build into. Yeah, no, I was saying yesterday, Hucho, he's flogging a few of your ideas, which is absolutely awesome. Did I say northeast? I meant northwest. Anyway, I'm pretty much all going to leave it there, folks. Cheers for coming along. And I hope I've helped you folks out. And I will let I'll do a little bit of edit. There, there's Bianca. <laughs> Bye. Um, I'll do a bit of um, I think I can make this live straight away, but I'll edit, I'll pop some links in down below if I haven't done it already. So yeah, ending broadcast now in a three, two, one. Cheers, folks. <laughs>